Well, hey everyone, today I am talking with Tanya Wilson about narcissistic abuse and trauma bonding. So narcissist or being narcissist is something that gets thrown around a lot online. Everyone's just like, this person's a narcissist, that person's a narcissist. So today we're going to actually talk about what it actually is and what it isn't and that it's really not kind of as clean cut as we might think. Today, we're going to talk about some common signs and red flags that someone might be narcissistically abusive. And um, and we're also going to talk about how this particular abuse differs from other forms of abuse and why sometimes it can be a little challenging to recognize. So without further ado, I will introduce Tanya M. Wilson. She is a compassionate and experienced psychotherapist dedicated to creating a nurturing therapeutic environment. Uh, Her specialization lies, of course, in helping individuals recover from narcissistic abuse, and she offers a path forward with healing, self-discovery, and personal growth. Tanya's commitment to her clients' well-being shines through her supportive and empathetic approach to therapy that you will hear on this podcast today. As always, with all of our Let Love Begin episodes, take what is useful for you and leave the rest. This is Let Love Begin, a podcast for the recovering brokenhearted, ready to heal and reclaim their enthusiasm. Hi there, Tali here. And before we jump into our episode, I have a really small request for you. If you're enjoying our podcast and you find these episodes helpful and informative, would you mind taking a moment to leave us a review? Your feedback not only helps us improve, but it also helps others discover the show. Leaving a review is quick and easy, and it truly makes a difference in helping our podcast grow. In addition to that, I really value your thoughts and always love to hear what you think. Thank you so much for your support and for being the most important part of our community. Okay, so welcome Tanya Wilson. Thanks so much for being here today. That's okay. Thank you so much for having me. (laughs) Awesome. I am very excited today. We're going to talk about words that get thrown around a lot and let's uh, let's get clear once and for all about what they actually mean. Um, Mm. And they are narcissistic abuse and trauma bonding. So Mm. uh, let's just jump right in. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Great. Can you give us an overview of what narcissistic... uh, or I guess what an like people are like, oh, he's a narcissist. That's what I hear. That's what's ringing in my head right now. Yes. What does that mean? What is a narcissist? It's very interesting, isn't it? Because the word has definitely gained popularity. It's a real buzzword now, whereas you only need to tick back 10 years ago and hardly anyone knew about narcissism, what it was. Most people had never even heard the word before. So things have changed a lot, particularly in the last five years, but definitely over the last 10 years we've seen really big changes but essentially in terms of narcissism um, and to understand narcissistic abuse we really do have to also understand what narcissism is and what it isn't um, Mm -hmm. in order to understand what's happening when someone's um, been in a narcissistic abusive um, situation but with narcissism I see it the way I explain it is narcissistic behaviors are on a spectrum just like any human behaviours, you know. So you can get um, a whole range of different intensities and behaviours that are contained within a narcissistic personality, if you like. Um, And so, you know, when you look at it in a spectrum, you begin to realise that it's not just one thing or just because someone says he or she's a narcissist doesn't actually mean that they're a person with narcissistic personality disorder. And so when I explain the spectrum, I would say that narcissistic personality disorder sits right at the very end of that spectrum. And some people, yes, do get diagnosed with that. And that's a very specific personality disorder. A lot of categories kind of need to be ticked in order for someone to be having that Mm -hmm. and that's only something that could be diagnosed by a psychologist or psychiatrist and the interesting thing is when people have narcissistic traits and qualities they generally don't go to therapy they're not the sort of people to go to therapy and they're definitely not usually unless there's you know it's been court ordered or something like that um, they're not usually the type of person to go hey I think I've got narcissistic personality disorder can you diagnose me that they don't like that language, they usually don't like the label and they're not likely to go and get themselves tested. So there's probably a lot of people that have that but are just not diagnosed because it comes with the territory. They're not the sort of people to go and go and see a psychologist anyway. However, if we know that there are there is this particular personality disorder that fits the description of a narcissist but it's quite intense and it's quite specific, 
we've also got all the behaviours and all of these kind of different levels of intensity that exist in human nature that are what I call traits or behaviours um, or even energy, you know. So when people come to me and they, they're trying to figure out if they've been in a relationship with someone who's narcissistic, we really work with that spectrum and it's really not about saying, yes, this person has NPD, but more about well, what traits and behaviours have you been seeing? What have you been experiencing from this person? Um, and in terms of those behaviours and traits, they tend to be um, well, commonly very controlling, you know, so control is a very big factor when it comes to narcissistic behaviours, um, but also very manipulative with that control too. So sometimes it doesn't necessarily need to be overt control. It can be very covert control. So there's usually an element of great degrees of control and manipulation. And then there's also a lot of drama that comes with narcissistic behaviour as well. And they really like to create a lot of drama to keep everyone else on their toes and kind of keep everyone else guessing. Um, and so, you know, there's a whole list of different traits and qualities that would fit into narcissistic personalities. Um, and, you know, it would probably take us a long time to kind of go through all of that. But if you think about narcissistic people with narcissistic traits, being very controlling, being very manipulative, really enjoying creating drama to get their own way. They also tend to be very grandiose. And even people that are more, more covert or more undercover with their narcissism, they're still grandiose. They just do it in a very different way, you know, so the internal thinking is still very grandiose and over the top um, rather than, uh, you know, what most people would assume as kind of a, a normal, natural way of being in the world. Uh, narcissists tend to be very extreme, very over the top, very grandiose, even the ones that don't appear to be, if that makes sense. <laughs> What's an example of control or trying to control someone mm. or some things? Mm. And, and when we talk about control, are we talking about someone trying to control someone else or to control like their surroundings? Mm, absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting because when we break down these behaviour traits, they could be occurring anywhere. So when I talk about control, it doesn't mean that if you see someone that's controlling, that it automatically makes them narcissistic. Right. You know, there's also a great degree of lack of empathy when it comes to narcissistic behaviours. And so when I'm working with clients for them to try and figure out what's actually going on, often it's that lack of empathy that really highlights whether it's narcissistic or whether it's coming from some other place. So in terms of control, as I explain control, it doesn't necessarily mean that someone's narcissistic if they're being controlling. But in a narcissistic version of control, they're usually trying to control everyone else. So it's about controlling other people. It's about putting things in place, using manipulation, using emotional manipulation a lot of the time to control others. And this can be very, very diverse. So it could be anything from controlling what someone's wearing and how they appear um, to controlling them sexually. So in narcissistic abuse situations, there's a very, very high incidence of people being sexually exploited. And so there's a, a high element of control when it comes to the sexual side of life with narcissistic personalities. Um, and people often walk away from those relationships saying, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I let myself go down that path or be exploited in that way because I never would have usually, you know, this is not in my nature. And so they have a large degree of control over um, people's behaviours and, and start to manipulate how they show up in the world. So let's stay on that example for just a minute. And if someone does find themselves in that situation, how would they get out of that then? Because if they're saying, you know, I can't believe I did that, I can't believe that this happened, how is it that they escape that situation? Well, it all comes back to the abuse cycle, you know. So usually by the time there's some sort of sexual exploitation happening in a relationship, there's been a lot of groundwork already done 
So there's usually a lot of emotional abuse that happens prior that basically chips away at that person's self-esteem but also makes them feel like they're kind of in servitude to that person. So there is, you know, you talked about trauma bonding before, you introduced that that phrase trauma bonding. Usually there's a high degree of trauma bonding going on in these situations where the person that's being exploited kind of feels like they don't really have any choice. So the only way out of that is those moments of horror for themselves where they go, I can't believe I just did that or I can't believe I took part in that or was part of that. And then they usually come to therapy. And it's not normally about the narcissist. It's about how could I let myself do this? And sometimes it may not be sexually. Sometimes it's with illegal acts, you know, criminal activity and stuff like that. Here's a person that would never normally do that and finding themselves in that situation because the narcissist has manipulated them into siding with them in that way. And so in order to get out of that, usually it is these kind of events where the person really has that cognitive dissonance. I know I'm not this person, but I've gone and done this thing or I've participated in this thing that really isn't me. And that cognitive dissonance is so hard and so harsh for them that they usually seek out some kind of help. You know, they might be ringing a helpline or they might be coming to counselling. And then the process from there is rebuilding their self-esteem. So rebuilding that person's self-esteem, their sense of self-worth, so that they can eventually get themselves out of that situation. But it's a pretty long process. I'm not going to gloss over that. It's not something that most people can just extract themselves from. Occasionally I hear that where people have been so shocked that they've gone, oh my God, I've just got to get out of here. And that does work for some people. But for most people, it's very entrenched and there's been a lot of emotional abuse leading up to it. So there's a lot of unpacking and winding and, and unraveling that needs to happen in order for them to extricate themselves from those situations. That sounds super complex. We mentioned, we touched on trauma bonding. Let, let's open up that can of worms for a second. Um, what is trauma bonding and how does it occur and how does it influence your ability to kind of be more entrenched in that situation that you were just describing and make it harder for you to leave? Let's talk a little bit about bonding first um, because that's a really important aspect of it to understand that as human beings, we innately have this inbuilt function to bond with other human beings. And in trauma bonding, that natural inbuilt function is kind of being used against us. And so in bonding, what happens is humans are geared, they're wired to bond with each other. And the first time that this happens is with our mothers when we're born. Well, hopefully it happens, sometimes it doesn't, but naturally bonding ideally would happen with the mother first and then the father and other adults secondarily. And this inbuilt function is a survival mechanism. So it's actually really important that it's there because without the ability to bond with the mother and to be able to smell her, recognise her touch, recognise her eyes, you know, there's all these sensory things that come into play with bonding. Um, so usually for a baby, what they're recognising, even though they're sight not fully formed, they can smell her smells, they can recognise the touch of her skin, they recognise the sound of her heartbeat. And so all of these things are actually really important to know when it comes to trauma bonding because this is the inbuilt function of all humans. Now the second time that bonding comes around is when people start to have sexual relationships. And so our first kind of ability to bond is happening at birth and, and you know through childhood this natural bonding process. But then when we start to go through puberty and we're starting to have sexual relationships, then there's this kind of second turning of bonding that happens in relationships and that happens through sexual engagement and sexual touch. And all those same mechanisms come on board again, you know. And so you notice when someone's talking about falling in love with someone, they're talking about, I love the sound of their voice or I love it when they... They, you know, the, the feel of their touch on my skin or being skin to skin with someone, um, you know, all of these sensory things that happen to us very naturally when we bond. Now, knowing all of that, we can understand trauma bonding because what happens in trauma bonding, it's the very person that creates the trauma is also the comfort for us. And that's how trauma bonding works. So you get, and typically with narcissistic behaviours, 
the narcissist will create some kind of trauma. And that might sound like a strong word for somebody, but that is actually what they do. They create a lot of trauma for the people that they're in relationships with. And so I'm not exaggerating here. It is legitimate trauma that they create for the person that they're in relationship with. So they've created the trauma. But then they rush in afterwards and use all of this sensory stuff to kind of scoop that person up, to have them feel better, to soothe them and kind of create this natural bonding that naturally happens in relationship. But they're the very person that caused the the trauma in the first place. Naturally, when we've had any trauma, we're looking for connection with another human being in order for our nervous system to reset and to calm. And so in these situations of trauma bonding, what you get is someone that's just been traumatised, looking for and needing human connection to soothe their nervous system, and in comes the very person that's created the trauma and helps to soothe them. And very soon you get these patterns of he or she is the one that's creating this, but they're also the one to help me to get back to balance after the trauma, after the stress, after the upset, after the overwhelm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. When the um, when you talk about trauma, what kind of traumas are you talking about? Like screaming matches, um, like gaslighting, like what kind of trauma are you talking about? Um, but I just kind of want to give the listeners something to kind of identify with if something like this is, might have happened to them. More well, absolutely gaslighting and um, what was the other thing you mentioned, sorry? Like r- screaming matches. Um, over, like I, I had a partner who was completely overreacted to her and it was obviously from knowing him it was from a place that he's been traumatised but mm-hmm. then he in turn traumatised me by like completely overreacting to a tiny mm-hmm. thing. Like the antecedent or the trigger was definitely not as, you know, as big as he was making it out to be. Oh, yeah. And so all of that can be part of what someone experiences as a trauma. But when I'm talking about trauma bonding, it's probably a little bit more specific than that. And so typically in a narcissistic relationship, there will be something like um, very reckless driving that creates a car accident or forcing someone to do something that they're actually not capable of doing. So, you know, perhaps taking them on a bike ride and they've only just started riding bikes, right, you know, on the mountain biking I'm talking about. Um, And so, you know, they might go, this is my thing, this is my hobby, you must come with me. And the other person's quite nervous, no, I'm not ready for that yet. No, come on, let's do these heels, let's do these jumps. And then, of course, the person that's not ready for it hurts themselves really badly. But it's all orchestrated by the narcissistic person trying to control them and put them in a very unsafe situation. You know, so in a healthy relationship, the partner that might be enthusiastic and excited to get the other person on board would eventually hear the person going, I'm actually not ready for that. I don't, I feel like I'm going to hurt myself. And they would stop there. But the narcissist just keeps going and keeps going until that person agrees they do something and they hurt themselves badly, you know. So in terms of trauma, it can be very physical trauma. It can right. also be things like being locked in rooms, being locked in a home and not being able to get out or locked in a room and not being able to get out. That can be very traumatising for people. It can be physically being pinned down, for example. But it can also be things like betrayal trauma. And that's very common also in narcissistic abuse situations where very early on usually in a relationship someone, um, the other partner, finds out about some um, betrayal that's happened and that can be extremely traumatising for people, especially when they're not expecting it. You know, the beginning of a relationship, everything's going fine, this person's behaving like an angel and then all of a sudden they find out there's another party and um, that can be very very traumatising, betrayal trauma. So, yeah, trauma, yes, absolutely, the the verbal abuse, screaming matches, gaslighting, they can all be part of um, chronic trauma. But in terms of trauma bonding, it usually is something more of an event and more specific. And when I do recovery work with clients, they usually do go back to one or two very specific 
events and it's usually happening very early on in the relationship. Okay. And can trauma bonding happen between people who are not in a romantic relationship, like people going through something traumatic together? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's slightly different, you know. So when people go through something traumatic, together there is a bonding that happens for people that have been through the same thing at the same time but that is slightly different to trauma bonding so when people refer to trauma bonding they're usually referring to this effect that happens in toxic or high conflict relationships but that can also be like work relationships or between family members or, or even friendships actually too, as well as love relationships. So it does span the whole gamut of every sort of relationship you could imagine. Yes, you could have trauma bonding in any of those relationships, but it's always a situation where the person that's creating the trauma is also the one to soothe the other person that they're traumatising. And that particular um, dynamic is what we refer to when we're talking about trauma bonding. However, if two people went through something traumatising together, let's say they worked in a bank and they were both tellers and the bank got held up and and it was, um, you know, very traumatising for each of those people, those two tellers may feel like they had, they grew Together, there was something that bonded them through that experience, through the horror of having to go through that together. They came out of that having a stronger bond together. And that is different to what people refer to when they're talking about trauma bonding. Going back to the narcissistic abusive relationships, um, because it is such a spectrum and there's not like kind of one thing that we can pinpoint or, you know, help our listeners with, is there some like common signs or red flags that someone may, may be in a narcissistic abusive relationship and not realise? Yeah, definitely. And so I think the number one big, big thing with this, and this is a, I love your question because it's a, actually a very important question because when you look at narcissistic behaviours, because there is so many, and but also these behaviours, if you just took each of the behaviours out, it wouldn't necessarily mean that that person's narcissistic. Right. So a lot of people do come in and see me and they say, I think my partner's narcissistic. But then actually when we break it down, it may actually be something else. Yes, they do have some narcissistic traits, but the underlying reason that's happening is not because they're a narcissist. That's a whole nother conversation. But when it comes to what's happening for the person in it, that's absolutely the best way to determine what's going on for you. And so in terms of those kind of symptoms and signs, confusion is the absolute number one thing. So if you're in a relationship or starting a relationship and you just feel confused and that's the main primary thing you're feeling, it's probably very likely that you're in a relationship with someone with high narcissistic traits. That setting off of confusion is usually very deliberate and it's done to kind of destabilise the other person And basically the whole basis of these narcissistic relationships is to destabilise the other person so that they become dependent on the narcissist. So the kind of the MO, you know, the the ultimate goal of the narcissist is really to make the people that they're in relationship with very dependent on them, you know, so that there's this kind of unbreakable bond that that person will never leave me. And so in order to do that, they really need to shake the ground. They really need to shake the foundations of the person that they're with and that's done by confusing them and making them doubt themselves. So if you're finding that you're very much doubting yourself and especially if you never used to do that but in this relationship you are and you're feeling very confused, um, there's there's probably a lot of narcissistic behaviours going on. One of the main things that narcissists do commonly use is a combination of projection and deflection. So one of the big things that I hear a lot is whatever the narcissist is doing, they're actually saying that the other person is doing it. That's interesting. I can think of someone doing that at the moment. (laughs) (laughs) Very clearly. (laughs) Yeah. And so when we learn this, it actually becomes really helpful, right? Because if you've got someone that you're in relationship that is constantly on your case about having affairs or flirting with other people or doing things that are outside the boundary of the relationship and you're like, I am not doing those things and you know in yourself 
that you haven't been doing that, then it's probably a projection, you know. I mean, there are cases where that can happen when someone's been betrayed before and so they're suspicious, but usually that's talked about, you know, in a healthy relationship, someone can be scared that the other person's cheating on them. But they usually go to that person and have a reasonable adult conversation about it or they might go to couples counselling and sort through that. But with someone that's narcissistic, they won't do that. They'll just keep blaming you. (laughs) So lack of responsibility, lack of accountability. Absolutely. It's always everybody else's fault, never my fault. Right. Gosh, this sounds like a horrible person to be with. (laughs) That's right. And that's why I say to people it's a spectrum. But even if someone hasn't been diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder, if you're around someone that's kind of up that end of the spectrum, it's still not comfortable, right? So you actually need to know if someone's got it or not. You just, you know it from feeling it. You know it by going, I don't want to spend time with this person. And often that is the case. Most people that are in these relationships, they actually don't really want to be around that person. And they're quite confused as to why they're still there. I know this person is really bad for me. I know this person is toxic, but I just can't seem to get away. I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that. It's like, why am I doing this to myself? At that point, I think when you're at that realization, you're like, now, well, this is what I think anyway with myself. I'm like, well, now it's now that I know about it, it's like yeah. the curse of knowing. It's now it's my fault because I can leave, you know. But mm-hmm. like you said, then there's those things of like the trauma bonding, which makes it hard, and or it might be financial, or you know, lots yeah. of reasons where why you know in your yourself that you should be leaving, but you can't for whatever reason. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, with narcissistic abuse, it does tend to be very multifaceted. And so you mentioned financial, absolutely that could be going on, but alongside a whole heap of other abuses as well. And so with narcissistic abuse, I say there are seven abuses and three traumas. And when we look at that whole kind of group of things that are going on. It can be financial abuse. It can be emotional abuse. It can be verbal abuse. It can be physical abuse. It can be sexual abuse. It can be spiritual abuse. And then in terms of the the traumas, we're usually experiencing emotional trauma, physical trauma, and spiritual trauma. Well, hey there, it's Talia here. And I wanted to take a quick break to let you know that I started this podcast when I went through my most significant breakup. And what really helped me at the time was listening to other people's stories of healing and how they transformed through their breakup. That really helped me understand what I was going through and really gave me help that I could get there too. Before this podcast, I created an online summit where I interviewed 21 experts talking about different aspects of breakups and how we can let go of our ex and begin to open our hearts again. It's called the Let Love Begin Summit. And if you're interested in watching or listening to the summit, you can go to rebellove.com forward slash summit and use the code podcast for 20% off. It's usually just $21, which is a dollar per interview, but you can get it for around 16-ish using the code podcast. I hope you get as much out of it as I got making it. Okay, back to the episode. What do you mean by spiritual? Let's let's talk about that for a second. And so with um, the spiritual side of it, oftentimes it it can be very specific in terms of someone's religion. So oftentimes going into a relationship like this, religion is challenged. So for example, someone's going into a relationship and they might be Christian, then usually the narcissist will have a problem with that religion and try and convert them to something else, you know, and that might be just making them atheist, you know, it's like you, if you're in this relationship with me, there is, you can't have your religion, it's either your religion or me. And so there's usually early on some sort of change to that person's belief systems about their spirituality, whether that's got a religious part to it or not, there's some sense of spirituality that's being challenged by the narcissist. And it's usually also combined with this even if there's no religious connection, for a lot of people it's this sense of self and for most people that kind of comes under that banner of their spirituality, their spiritual world is how they feel about themselves and how they feel connected in the world or maybe even connected to nature. And in narcissistic relationships, this is very early on taken away from them because it can um, be seen as a threat to the narcissist. 
So say, for example, someone's got a beautiful community that they love connecting with, they might go off to, say, meditation classes regularly or they might do yoga regularly and that forms part of their spiritual world and then they enter into a narcissistic relationship. It's like, no, you can't do that anymore. You know, the narcissist just kind of systematically starts to strip that away from them. And in a lot of cases, it's just it becomes too hard to fight against them. You know, there might be a big drama or a big yelling match every time they go off to yoga or meditation. It's like, it's just too hard. I'll just stay home. So that's kind of an example of how that spiritual trauma really works in that it's traumatized someone on that spiritual level in that something that they had a belief about has been stripped away from them. They don't know where their belief system lies anymore. And it can really cause a spiritual crisis. And people don't realise how multifaceted it is. And a lot of people ask me the question, well, what's different about narcissistic abuse compared to other abuses? Mm -hmm. And the big difference is with narcissistic abuse that they have um, a range of different abuses that they will use. So often they might be kind of verbally abusive or they might be um, emotionally abusive. They use a couple of different forms of abuse to kind of break someone down or wear them down. And when someone's really worn down, then they implement financial abuse or sexual abuse or something like that. And so there's usually like a whole range of different abuses happening over time um, that makes it very complex. Whereas if someone's in a physically abusive relationship, it's it can be just very blatantly just that. Yeah, it's a bit more clean cut, isn't it, than this is kind of like, uh, yeah, I relate to what you said about breaking them down. It's kind of like um, obviously this is not the same but I'm using this as an example of that. You know, when you when you have kids and they just keep nagging and nagging and yeah. nagging and then, and then they break you down and then you're yeah. like, okay, fine. So I guess this would be the same in a narcissistic relationship where they're like, let me just keep really consistent and see Absolutely. if I can break them down. Absolutely. And many, many examples of that in in terms of therapy, like I hear that all the time. And if I was to kind of, you know, this isn't about anyone in particular, but many, many times I've heard of people being locked in rooms and berated for, you know, 12 hours overnight. So they're sleeping and they're, they're also you know, being berated over that time. And can you imagine how broken down someone is by the end of that? Yeah. Gosh, that's exhausting. And I've heard that many times. That's not just a person's story. This is this is common in narcissistic relationships. What what other things do you hear that are quite common when you when you talk about people in narcissistic trauma? The betrayal trauma is very, very common. And um, not long into specialising in this work, I realised that, you know, working with people that had been cheated on and experiencing betrayal trauma actually forms a big part of my work as well because it is just so common in narcissistic situations. And it kind of comes from this entitled, grandiose, personality where the person that's going off and having the affairs often feels like they're just they should be able to it's not a big deal it's not a big deal just you know it's just I wanted it I took it why does this matter yeah why are you making such a big deal out of it exactly yeah right yeah which is kind of really like a form of you know gaslighting or minimizing your feelings Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. And they really do truly see it like that. You know, what's so bad about this behavior? Right. This is just something I need, something I want. It's more about them wanting the other person to learn to be okay with it rather than them taking responsibility for betraying the other person. See, this is where the complexities come in because I think a lot of people would leave at that point and be like, no, this is not okay. This is outside the boundaries of what we agreed in our relationship. But I guess that's where the other forms of abuse and the like trauma bonding come in where you're like questioning your own self-worth and even reality, sense of reality of the situation. Absolutely, absolutely. And usually by that point, you know, a lot of people in these relationships, safety is such a big thing and so For a lot of people in these relationships, just getting very quiet, not saying too much, not fighting back, they've kind of learnt through the relationship that being as small and as quiet and as submissive as possible usually causes the least amount of drama because we've got to remember that creating drama is a big 
part of the narcissist's toolbox. You know, they, they use that a lot. And so if you've got someone that really doesn't like drama and just wants to minimise conflict as much as possible, they'll learn in a narcissistic relationship to become very submissive and very quiet. And so it's like, okay, I would rather have myself exploited than to create the drama that I know is going to happen if I fight back against this or say, no, I don't want to do this, for example. It's interesting, actually, as you were just saying that, I was kind of like flicking through the file in my head. I'm like, who do I know? And this one person stood out and I was like, yeah, you, you just never say anything because it's such a drama. Like every single time you bring something up, there is like aggression, a big song and dance about it. And it's just like, I can't be bothered. I don't have the energy to go there. And so mm-hmm. it's really interesting that you say that. I never really thought of that person being narcissistic, but maybe there is an, an element of that. Yeah. And see, once you can understand these things, you can just stand back and watch and observe, like, what else is showing up there, you know? Right. Yeah. So quite often for narcissists, the what's underlying their behaviour is a very, very deep sense of insecurity almost like a hollowed out internal world where they're not really sure who they are. They feel very insecure deep down underneath. But of course, they don't want anybody to know that. So there are massive facades that are put in place to protect that. But what that then results in is that it is very easy for a narcissist to feel offended or criticised. And so it could just be as simple as they might say, hey, let's go out for lunch. And then you say, actually, sorry, I have to change that last minute, I can't can't do that anymore, and they take that an, as an absolute offence and criticism and kind of be reeling for days, you know, so they'll do a big song and dance about the fact that you couldn't go out for lunch with them. So it's interesting to see what's coming up for me when you talk about all these things and, like, who, who can I think about who behaves like this? We usually do have examples in our life of, of people like that, and like I said, it's really important not to go or just because they've got these traits or these behaviours right. make them narcissistic. However, when you learn about these things, what may happen is as you stand back and observe, you may see other things that you didn't notice before. So as one thing comes to mind, you might go, oh, yeah, and they do that, and they do that, and they do that, and maybe even have a look at the people that are in relationships with them. How are they? What do they appear like? Do they look mm-hmm. a little battered? Are they a little worn down? Quite often, you know, socially what will happen, particularly when people have been in narcissistic abusive relationships for a long time, so I'm talking, you know, 5, 10, 15 years, what will happen is socially most people think that the person, um, let's say the victim of narcissistic abuse, they will actually think that they're a horrible person and they feel sorry for the narcissist because what normally happens is that person's so worn down and so abused that they, you know, they can be nasty. They don't have any filter left. So in public, they might be like, oh God, you know, he or she drives me crazy. Or um, they might speak rudely or they might, you know, disregard their partner in public because they just kind of can't stand them anymore, you know. And other people see that and go, oh, she doesn't treat him so nice. (laughs) But they don't understand what's going on behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. With a narcissist, They'll never do that in public. They're very careful about how they appear in public. So all of what they do is behind closed doors. They want to make sure that everyone else sees them in the best way possible and the best light, but then the person that they're in relationship with is the one that kind of cops it all behind closed doors. So what when people come to you, is there something that normally happens that kind of drives them to seek help? And is, is there sort of like a typical pattern that you see with that? Yes, most people come and see me because either they've done something that they never thought they would do. For example, they may have hit their partner or slapped their partner. They may have kicked in the side of the car. They've smashed a window, you know, done something quite extreme that they never thought that they would be able to do, perhaps in a fit of rage or anger, you know. And so that's a big thing that normally drives people to therapy. And they're coming because they want to work out why they're so angry. But then as that gets unpacked, we realise, well, there's a pretty good reason why you're so angry and this may not be all your fault. So that's usually one big reason why people will come in. The other one is they're trying to work out, am I actually the narcissist? I think I'm narcissistic. 
I can't work it out. I've done all this reading. I've done all this research on narcissism, but it kind of sounds like me too. And now I can't work out whether it's my partner or me. Maybe it is me. And so they come to therapy and one of the first things I say to them, don't stress too much because if you were truly narcissistic, you wouldn't have brought yourself to therapy. You would have been more thinking, I don't need help. It's the other person. Right. (laughs) Because true narcissists will always blame everyone else and not take responsibility. Coming to therapy is a way of taking responsibility for yourself and trying to work out how do I change these toxic behaviours. And so that confusion element again, you know, that person being very confused about what's going on here, who's the toxic person, maybe I maybe I am as bad as what he or she says that I am. Okay, so we know that therapy is definitely a form of uh, healing and recovery for sure, but um, what are some steps we can do? Perhaps maybe we're just listening to this and realising, like having a few epiphanies and we're not quite ready for therapy yet or we can't afford it, we're not in a position to afford it. What are some things that we could do to begin that healing and recovery from narcissistic abuse? Well, the big thing, and it's also the hardest thing, is to turn the attention back to yourself because what a lot of people do, and this is a very natural thing that happens, is that we're trying to work out what's going on. So we're actually spending a lot of time and a lot of focus on the other person, right, because you're trying to work out what's going on. Have they got some sort of personality disorder? Maybe it's their trauma from the past that's making them like this. Maybe it's this, maybe it's that, you know. And so usually for people in these situations, they're expending a terrible lot of energy and time and resources trying to work out the other person. But that's not really going to help you. And the big thing is to, to turn that around, to flip that script and you start to focus on yourself. Now, this isn't in a self-blaming way. This isn't about saying, okay, well, what's my problem then? If it's not his problem or her her problem, it must be mine, so what's my problem? I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying give yourself some focus, give yourself some time, give yourself some attention, give yourself those things that you've been missing out on in this toxic relationship and then see where things land, you know. The big trap that people get into with a narcissist is trying to make them better. Most people are in it and continue to be in it because they think something's going to change soon or that they're going to be able to, with their love, with their support, with their understanding, that this other person will change their behaviour. But guess what? Mostly they don't. (laughs) What I've learned from also part of my practice is doing couples counselling and what I've learned from that is that people that want to work on their relationship and want to work on their behaviour, they do something about it. They're willing to do something about it so if you can already see that that person's not willing to do anything about it that's the number one sign just to turn the energy and the focus back on yourself what are you missing out on what do you need how can you fulfill your own needs fill your own cup and through that process some people then are able to go you know what I need a bit of external help with this I might need some therapy or some coaching or I might need to do a course or something to help them to get back the interest in themselves again and rebuild that self-esteem. That, that's a, Yeah, that's definitely a good place to start. Thank you so much. And what about if you're a friend or family of someone who is experiencing narcissistic abuse, what's the best way to be there for them? If, you, if you're like infuriated because you can see it happening, but they're not doing anything about it at this stage, how can you be supportive? Well, actually, you know, one of the most supportive things you can do is keep a journal, keep a diary, And you make dates and times and information about what's happening and when it's happening because narcissistic abuse happens so undercover that for so many people, you know, they might get to a point where I need to report this person to the police or I need to take out an intervention order on this person, I need to get away from this person, but they find they have no evidence to give there's actually nothing that they can pin on that person and so as a family member or a friend if you're keeping messages that that person's messaged you about that that other person's behavior or even if you're documenting it yourself that's one of the most supportive things you can do hopefully you will never need to use that but if you ever do that can come in very handy in terms of um, representing a pattern and a cycle of events that are happening over and over. And at the very least, it can also be helpful for your friend if they do leave the situation, are able to leave the situation, and then they get self-doubting and they're like, oh, maybe it wasn't that bad. You can say, no, look, 
<laughs> you know, this, these are all the times, these are all the things that were happening, let's read it in black and white. So that can be extremely supportive for a friend or a family member. In terms of what they, what you would be doing with them directly, just never, ever minimise their experience. Try not to use wording like, oh, look, it's the father of your children or the mother of your children or this person's your mother or this person's your sister. You've got to maintain a relationship with them. Just do the best you can to maintain a relationship with them. That type of thing tends to really backtrack people in these abusive situations. What they really need to hear is someone saying, tell me more, what else are you feeling? What else is going on for you? Give them a space where they can talk about their feelings. Don't minimise by saying you really should keep a relationship with this person because they're the father of your children or they're your mother or they're your sister. It's not very helpful at all. Right. What resources um, do you recommend for listeners that suspect they might be in it? Like how can they kind of flick through their files of what's been happening and that they've just had the epiphany and just realised? There is an incredible amount of online resources. There are several um, like social media groups, you know, Facebook groups and so on that support literally thousands and thousands of people going through this. And so it's almost like dipping into a forum where you can hear so many similar examples from what you'd be going through in your own life. I do say this with a word of warning, though, in that whether it's on Facebook groups or whether you're looking at YouTube channels and resourcing yourself that way, be careful not to label the person as a narcissist when it could be something else, you know. So you may need to dig into it a little bit more. You may need to educate yourself a little bit more. Try not to be too rash with deciding that, yes, this is definitely it. I've had several clients that have come in and gone, this person ticks all the boxes and they're definitely what, you know, everyone's saying a narcissist is. They tick everything. And then we start talking about something else like obsessive compulsive disorder, for example, or ADHD. And they may also have traits of that too. And they may also be very empathetic. And so we've got to be careful that just because someone's ticking all the boxes doesn't actually mean that it's coming from that place of narcissism. So Mm. go into it with an open mind, get what you need from it. But in terms of online resources, do a little bit of searching on Facebook to find a group that you gel with because you will get a lot of peer support in those groups. And then the other thing in terms of healing, um, a fantastic podcast that I think is very good. It's by a psychotherapist in America. Her name's Christiane, uh, sorry, Christine Hammond, and she's got a podcast called Understanding Today's Narcissist. Because she's a psychotherapist, it does come very much from that understanding brings healing point of view rather than trying to label the narcissist. It's more about the person that's going through it and their experience. So I would tell people to lean more in that direction. In terms of what I've got available, I do have a free seven-part audio series that anybody can download. It's called Understanding Narcissistic Abuse, and that can be a really great first step for people as well. It's totally free. You just jump on, you click on it, and um, and you know, you'll have access to that, and you'll be able to listen to that audio. And I've got several people that give me feedback that they've listened to it over and over again because it's so helpful it helps them really to to sink into what's going on and understand what's going on great and where can we go to find that um just onto my website so if you go to my website it's the first little um, banner that comes up and then you can just click on that and it will guide you through being able to access it from there and your website is tanyamwilson.com that's right. Yeah. And we yeah. will uh, we'll also link that in the show notes as well. Well, Tanya, yeah. thank you so much for being here. This has been a really useful conversation. Right. Yeah. I've learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, I don't, I don't think that I know any narcissists. Um, if you are unfortunate and do have these types of people with these types of traits and someone wants to work with you, can they do that online or how can they? Look, actually, at the moment, I'm in the process of training other therapists. So my my diary is completely full. That is how common <laughs> this stuff is. So there is a lot of it out in the world. And um, because I work online, I do work with people globally, mostly in Australia. But, you know, there are some overseas um, clients that I see as well. But what I am doing is I'm training other therapists to understand and work with narcissistic abuse because when you're in this situation you really do want a therapist that gets it Um, 
because unfortunately regular counselling training can have people working on communication skills and you can't really work on communication skills when you're in a relationship with a narcissist. You know, so there are some some kind of idiosyncrasies to working in this field and so um, I've got some therapists that are working with me to understand this more and to help clients in that area so I have a great referral network so people can always get in touch with me and then I can refer them to the other therapists that I've trained specifically in this area um, and that have the same skills as what I do in this area as well. So I think a seven-part series is a great place to start and then if you need more help get in touch and you can be referred. Yeah, absolutely. And I do have other things coming out. So this year I'm hoping to publish a book on narcissistic abuse and specifically recovery from narcissistic abuse. So people can always keep their eye out for that. I find books and, you know, self-help type things can be very affordable and very helpful in that you get to go at your own pace and you get an understanding and, um, yeah. So, yeah, I'm hoping to have that out soon for people. Thank you so much, Tanya. It's been a pleasure. No worries. Take care. This podcast is a Rebel Love production.